Glory to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, today the spirit of commerce is really operating and merchants are no longer hiding themselves concerning the financial gain that they seek to obtain by way of making merchandise out of the name of the Lord. And so there is nothing new under the sun. These merchants know the scriptures and they have read, as you and I have read, that Jesus chased the money changers away from the temple. It is not that they were selling things that it was forbidden to sell per se. For instance, if they sold pigeons, it was a legitimate thing to sell pigeons. But the problem is that they were doing it in a way where they approached the temple with a perspective of it being a marketplace where their business would do well because they would approach the people who would possibly need those pigeons since you had to offer pigeons as sacrifice in the context of offerings at times. They approached the clientele at the temple, but Jesus made it clear that the temple is not the place of commerce. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. It is a place of worship. And so these merchants, they know this, but they want to twist the scriptures and make it appear as though they are evangelizing by promoting the gospel, by selling different items that pertain to the gospel. But Jesus was clear, the gospel is not to be intertwined with commerce. You remember in Ezekiel chapter 28, how Satan, in the image here of the prince of Tyrus, he started getting involved with trafficking. There were a lot of precious things that were created on the day that he was created, Satan. But he started trafficking. The spirit of commerce was in him where the precious things that he had, he tried to seduce others with them. And iniquity was found in him because he had a mind to operate traffic, trafficking, commerce, and using the lust of people for certain things to entice them. And so we go back to the book of Judges when you look at Micah and his house of idols. I believe it's Judges chapter 17. Micah had a house full of idols. It was a house filled with merchandise that pertained to the Lord. They would go to the founder, they would make a statue, and then they would put it in their home. And they would say, I have an artifact that pertains to the faith in God, and I'm putting it in my home, and I've purchased it, and now I'm in good standing with the Lord. So those merchants who, who would fabricate these artifacts, they made a living off of building idols. But the Lord condemns idols. They neither speak nor can they hear. And yet you turn to them for counsel. The Lord reproached the people for doing that. And also further in the book of Acts, you have Paul spreading the gospel and those who were building artifacts, idols, in the image of Diana, their goddess at Ephesus, they were upset, the merchants, because Paul was bringing people out of captivity and making them realize they did not need idols. And so the business of the idol builders, the idol makers, their business was hindered by the truth that Paul was bringing forward, that there was no connection between idols and the faith in the Almighty God. And therefore, we have to come to understand that the idols in the old day, today, they take on the form of merchandise in a variety of ways that it presents itself. In the book of Acts, when Peter healed the man who was lame before the temple, Peter said, Why do you look on us as if we had done something special of our own strength? It is by the power that is in the name of Jesus Christ that this man has been made whole. And Peter elevated the name of Jesus and associated all power to the name of Jesus. So you see the difference where in one instance the name of Jesus is elevated 
without compensation, without merchandise being attached to it, and the other context where people are looking for artifact that may be correlated to the gospel to purchase it and then feel that they have a connection with the Lord. You see, the Lord always commanded man not to make representations of the things above, in the heavens, or under the earth. Because he didn't want men to get involved with making representations of spiritual things because the Lord knew the hearts of man, that they would want to purchase these things, these items, to feel as though they had a connection with him. Where the Lord says that our connection with him does not go through any type of object, but it's a heart-to-heart -heart relationship, it's a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship, it is immaterial. And that's why we speak of faith, things we can't see. But a lot of people put their faith in objects, and therefore they engage unbeknownst to them, or willfully in witchcraft, where they use objects as charms. And therefore, as we just said, Peter did not look to make merchandise of the name of the Lord, but glorified the Lord, glorified his name, after that he performed this miracle and healed the lame man. But you have the spirit of commerce, the spirit of Gehazi, that thinks that when the Lord has demonstrated his goodness, when the Lord has demonstrated his power for free, and so Naaman the leper was healed for free, Gehazi still feels like he can intrude on the situation where Elisha was used to do this for free by the Lord, for the glory of the Lord, and the glory of his name, Gehazi feels that he still has to get some type of reward for something that has nothing to do with him. He's not the one who operated the miracle. He's not the one by whom and through whom the miracle was operated. Whereas Elisha himself, who was used to orchestrate the miracle and give the proper instructions to Naaman, he himself was not inclined to get any type of reward for the miracle that occurred. In Acts chapter 2 verse 22, we learn that Jesus was used by God to perform miracles, and yet he did not ask for a reward for the miracles he performed. And so the spirit of Gehazi seeks some type of retribution, some type of compensation, of reward for something that has nothing to do with their own person. Gehazi had no merit, but he feels like the things of God, the power of God, cannot go without monetization. And so he went in the back room, he went to the back way to try to get a reward for himself. The greed, the love of money, you see? And in doing that, you are usurping the glory and majesty of the name of the Lord because you believe you deserve something from it. When the Lord tells you clearly in Isaiah 42, 8, that he shares his glory with no one, what glory are you seeking for yourself in seeking a retribution, a compensation for whatever admiration the people may have for the name of the Lord? You think you deserve a cut. You don't. This brings about the following question. Are you smarter than Jesus? That's the claim you're making. You're saying where Jesus missed opportunities to capitalize on his popularity, to make money off the word, off of his name. And so here they are, according to themselves, smarter than the Lord, allegedly, supposedly, according to them, and able to engage in the commerce of merchandise to generate profit and sustain a ministry, or so-called ministry. You see, in Mark chapter 1, after that Jesus performed a miracle in the synagogue and delivered this man of an unclean spirit, we learn that his fame went abroad. And so he was famous. And Jesus, he knew that if he had wanted to, nothing would stop him from, from getting craftsmen to build artifacts with his name printed or carved on these pieces of art. And he could have sold many artifacts this way. He could have sold a lot of merchandise and become very rich, but he did not do that. 
it is certainly not because he lacked intelligence. There is no intelligence that compares to his. But he did not do it because that's not the model that he wanted us to follow, to have merchandise pertaining to the gospel that would be sold in order to finance a ministry. These are not the guidelines we received. You see, the Son of Man did not have a place to lie down his head. Is it because he wasn't a good enough businessman and he lacked intelligence, allegedly, supposedly, to earn revenue to guarantee that he would have a home? Not at all. He was showing us as the perfect example that the things that pertain to the gospel are not for sale. It is free. And it is in perfect alignment with the idea that we are saved by grace through faith and not by any work that we have done. It's a free gift. And therefore, we have received for free. We are to give for free. When Jesus sent the disciples off to evangelize, he told them not to take anything with them. He did not say, however, do make sure that you have some artifact, some objects, where you have my name carved in them or printed on them so that you can sell these articles based on my fame in case you lack money. Turn to that to finance the ministry and finance your mission when you go out evangelizing. No, he did not tell them to do that. He knew that it was a possibility, but he did not tell them to do that. Rather, he said, if you find a home where you are welcome to stay, stay there until the time that you depart from that place. And therefore, he was counting on the hearts that he himself would touch so that the people would be housing the missionaries. In the same manner that Jesus said, you will go to a certain place and you will see a colt in a certain place. And if the keeper of the colt asks you why you have need of it, just tell that person that it is for the master. And so, it was already known of Jesus that there would be people behaving in a certain way to accommodate his missionaries and his disciples in different circumstances. Just like when he wanted to go and eat the Passover, there was a certain person that they were going to be addressing, and Jesus had already planned everything in advance that they would cooperate and collaborate with the disciples to have a place ready for him. And so he sent off his disciples and had already touched the hearts in advance of certain people that they would accommodate the missionaries. If you look to the third epistle of John, we hear about Gaius, who is uh, commanded by John for being someone who, who helps the brethren and missionaries, whether they be local or coming from abroad. And so they are said to take nothing of the Gentiles, and therefore there is a need for saints to help each other out, in terms of lodging. In Philemon, Paul also tells Philemon, prepare me a lodging. So again, Jesus sent off his disciples. He did not tell them to have material to sell to finance their ministry. And so they overlooked the fact that Jesus was angry to see merchants come to the temple to make it a place of merchandise they would come to a place that would be a place of worship of God and turn it into a marketplace for the purpose of obtaining a gain, a financial gain. And Jesus was never in agreement with that. And so we give according to our hearts, according to the new covenant. And when Paul says in 1 Corinthians that those who preach the gospel live of the things of the gospel, what he is saying is that they have a right to ask for donations to finance their ministry. And this is why in Philippians chapter 4, Paul reminds the Philippians that they, the Philippians, have helped him out by providing for his needs. And so this is the biblical way of doing things. You receive donations. In the same manner in the book of Acts, the disciples, they sold their possessions and they put the money at the apostles' feet. It was for the purpose of the ministry. But where do you see in the gospel someone take something that pertains to the faith to go and sell it on the marketplace and make profit or obtain some type of gain 
financial gain from it for themselves. This never happens. And so there is a confusion here. The Levites, they serviced the temple. For instance, in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he serviced in the temple. And according to the law, the Levites received a portion. They received a tithe that allowed them to have sustenance in terms of their living. And so they gave themselves to their service in the temple and the people provided a way for them to have a way of sustenance. However, it was never the case that a Levite would take something in the temple or build something that had some type of connection to the temple and go and sell it in the marketplace for personal gain. They would not build a chandelier that resembled something from the temple and then go and sell it and tell that person, this is something that pertains to our Almighty God, this object, this artifact, buy it. I'm selling it to you. And that's the way I'm going to finance my living. They did not go about taking things from the temple to make them objects of commerce. And this is where the confusion lies. Paul never used anything that pertained to the gospel to go and sell it and obtain gain from it and get financial advantage from it. However, he received donations to finance his ministry. Now, the same thing for Jesus. He never sold anything, although his fame had gone about. He never sold anything with his name on it or did not have craftsmen build artifact with his name on it or carved in it. He never did that, and he knew it was a possibility, but he wanted men to stay away from idols. So now in our day, we have merchandise that's of a different nature, but the principle remains the same. You see, when the Lord says, do not take my name in vain, it also means that you don't take his name and turn it into a brand, a common brand. For instance, in the sports industry, you have certain brands. They have become household names. Well, you can't take the name of the Lord and turn it into a trademark. It is the name above every name. And yet you would want to take it down to the level of a trademark of this world, of a common brand that you would just print on merchandise and then claim that there would be a link between that merchandise and the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the most precious name above all names in which there is power. And you want to associate that to a brand that you would put on a t-shirt, on a mug, or on a pen, or on anything, and you want to claim that this object of merchandise, that you should sell it for personal gain. And so you're saying that the precious name of Jesus, you're saying that he who died on the cross, you're going to profit off of his work where you were not on the cross and where he did not choose to profit from that work in a financial way, you are going to do that. You who were not on the cross are going to profit from the name of he who was on the cross, but never chose to profit from it. And in fact, told us not to profit from it by not making his name something that is associated with commerce. Things of the temple are not to be associated with merchandise. But now what do you have? You have churches with commerce right inside of the church. There is a store. You have online ministries with a store tab, with a merchandise tab, where they're selling to you things that pertain to the faith, that pertain to the gospel, and they claim that it's to finance the ministry. They only need a donations tab, and that is well enough. And if they're not getting enough donations, it means that what they're doing, it is not being financed by the Lord. And so they need to revisit if that's what they need to be doing. Because the Lord never lacks money. And the Lord will provide himself because no one goes to a war at their own expense. And we are soldiers of the Lord and he provides everything we need. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, let us not use the name of the Lord for profit. It is a precious name and it's not an object of merchandise. It's not a trademark. Let's not make it at the level of a common trademark in this world. It is a prideful thing to say that you're going to profit from the name of Christ when he himself did not profit from his name. Further, when you're selling these merchandise, 
you're creating a context of idolatry where people may start now believing that they're in good standing with the Lord because they have a certain object where there would be a connection between that object supposedly and the Lord and they revert back to the old mentality that you need an idol, a statue or some type of object that has the name of the Lord on it so that you can be connected to Him where the Lord wants you to have a spiritual connection with Him. And therefore, just like the people under the Old Covenant were called to flee from idolatry and worshipping statues, in the same manner we are to flee idolatry in the sense that we are not to start thinking that we have safety in a t-shirt that bears the name of Jesus as though it were a trademark and that we are in good standing for this reason. We need to get back to the Word and have fellowship with the Lord by way of obeying His commandments. And that's how the Lord will know that we love Him and not because of something we own or don't own that may have His name as a trademark on it. And where people are trying to profit off of this, that's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that there's a difference between having a ministry and receiving donations because the people's hearts have been touched to lead them to finance your ministry in a sufficient manner for you to operate. That is different from you taking items, artifact, things that you produce connected to the gospel and you go out on your own to sell them to get profit and to get gain. Or even to finance your ministry. It is not by way of selling items connected to the faith that we are to finance our ministries. And this is the problem that we have today. The spirit of commerce, the mind of Gehazi, where people feel like the name of Jesus is popular, the Bible is popular, let me get a cut. Let me get involved in the money circuit that surrounds the interest for these things. And you want to act like you're evangelizing, you want to act like you're promoting the gospel, but you're creating a revenue for yourself based on the name of the Lord. And the name of the Lord is sacred. It is not an object of commerce. It is not a trademark. And so before you think in your self-righteousness and arrogance that you need a cut, like Gehazi felt he deserved a cut, ask yourself how you're going to do that when Jesus himself did not choose to do that having greater intelligence than you have. So now do you still think you're smarter than him? That you're a better businessman than him? That you're a better entrepreneur than he was? He showed us that the money of this world does not have his superscription because he is not calling us to invest in the things of this world, but rather to have our treasures in heaven. And so this is a warning for those of you who have the spirit of commerce and sometimes nowadays you see people who will advertise their online store even before they have spoken a word from the Bible. So now what are you preaching? Are you advertising yourself or the Lord? Are you seeking gain first and then to speak the word? Or is the gospel your priority? And so the hearts of man will be unveiled on that day. And everybody must be ready. And therefore, the spirit of commerce, if you are being influenced by that, you need to step out. And those of you who buy these things, you are validating what they're doing. You're validating their error. And therefore, you're partakers of their iniquity. There is no such thing as selling anything that pertains to the gospel for gain or for financing a ministry. Everything ought to work by way of donations, and the Lord is the one who will move the people and their hearts to be inclined to supporting what you're doing because you've been called by the Lord. And so be careful that you do not claim to be smarter than the Lord Jesus Christ by engaging in commerce where he did not engage in commerce, knowing that it was a possibility to do that, and where he understood better than you do that his fame had spread round about and that he could easily have turned it into a commercial opportunity, but did not do it. Not out of ignorance, but because it should not be done. And therefore, those of you who want to claim you're living off the things of the gospel and that you're entitled to do that, that's true. You can receive donations. 
But to say that you take something that is of the gospel to go and sell it, that's where there is a problem. You're not supposed to sell. And you can't make an excuse that you need to finance your ministry because the Lord does that. You don't do that by trying to be a smart businessman. It didn't work that way in the Bible, and it shouldn't work that way today. You have all been warned in a very clear manner. And those of you who were bewitched by this come out of it, that you be not punished alongside those who practice iniquity. May you be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen.